So we're going to spend our evening contemplating a place in the Qur'an in Surah Taha. This is Surah number 20 of the Qur'an. And it's one of the stories of Musa alayhi salam. Many of you are familiar with the story of Musa alayhi salam. This begins where the adventure with Fir'aun ends. So they've crossed the water, Fir'aun has drowned, they're on the other side. The Israelites have now been saved under the leadership of Musa alayhi salam. Musa alayhi salam, by Allah's command, when he struck the staff, the water parted. The Israelites, men, women, children, in the hundreds of thousands crossed. Fir'aun and his entire army follows. They all get drowned, they get crushed. And that's the first thing that I want you to know. Now, they're on the other side. The first thing Allah wants you to know is the way Allah spoke to them directly. Ya Bani Israel, Children of Israel, We have now rescued you from your enemy. We've just rescued you from Fir'aun. Okay, so now what? And we have taken a promise from you right on the right side of the mountain. What is this talking about the right side of the mountain? Way back when Musa السلام, ran away from Egypt, if you know the story. And then he got married and he had a new life. And one day he's traveling with his family and he sees what? He sees a fire. And he saw a fire on the right side of a mountain. And now Allah is talking to the Israelites and he's brought the Israelites from the water and he brought them to the same mountain where this whole story began. He brought them to the same mountain and said, and now I have taken a promise from you right by that same mountain. Why is that mountain significant? If Musa السلام, was never at that mountain, they would have never been freed. They would still be slaves in Egypt. The only reason they have that freedom now is because this entire story of revelation began with that mountain. And now after all of that rescue, Allah has brought them right by that mountain again and said, I have taken a promise from you from the side of that mountain. وَنَزَّلْنَا عَلَيْكُمُ الْمَنَّ وَالسَّلْوَى And I have sent down manna and salwa on you because they were in the desert. And because they were in the desert, there's no vegetation. They're all going to starve and dehydrate. So in Surah Al-Baqarah, we learn Allah covered them with a cloud that would follow them. So it was a divine umbrella that was following them so they wouldn't be scorched by the sun. And it would also give them rain and it would also give them shade. And now they don't have any food. So Allah gave them grain that they could grow in the desert. That's man and birds that wouldn't fly away when they tried to catch them because otherwise they wouldn't be able to eat. And that was salwa. So their proteins and their carbs and their hydration were taken care of. All the essential nutrients are done. And then the regular water supply, Allah had even given them the rock that broke up and it became 12 springs. So all the stuff they needed to survive after crossing was done. Now Allah is making a brief reference to it here and saying, we rescued you from your enemy. We took the promise from you from the side of the mountain and we've given you manna and salwa, meaning we've not only given you freedom, we've given you the resources to be able to survive and live a free life, fine. But then Allah says, Kulu min tayyibati ma razaqnakum. Eat from the good and pure things that we have provided you. What did Allah provide them? Allah provided them manna and salwa and He provided them the water that I mentioned. Okay, there's nothing else. There's no ketchup. There's no salt. There's no pepper. There's no salad. There's no dressing. There's no fries on the side. Nothing. You get nothing else. And you get the same food for breakfast. You get the same food for lunch. You get the same food for dinner. And if you're in the mood to drink something, what you're gonna get? You're gonna get water. There's no juice. There's no fruits. There's nothing else. And this is not the story here. It's the story in Baqarah. But in Baqarah, they got tired of eating the same food. This is also a test. But I'll briefly comment about that test to you. A brief comment I want to make to you is they used to live in Egypt. And in Egypt, they were free or were they slaves? They were slaves. But when they were slaves, they had vegetables and lentil and garlic and onion and cucumber. They had that stuff. They had a variety of food, but it came with a life of slavery. Now they're free. And now they don't get a variety of food, they only get one kind of food. Some of them started saying, hey, can you like make dua to Allah? I miss some of the old food from Egypt, man. I mean, baqliha wa kithaiha wa fumiha wa adasiha wa basaliha. In Surah Al-Baqarah, they went to Musa uh, Ya Musa, Allah likes to listen to your duas apparently. He could split water for you. I think he can arrange for a little bit of salad too. So why don't you ask Allah and here's the grocery list. So they gave him a list of vegetables to ask for. Because manna and salwa is good, but I mean, we, we got a little. So they gave him a list of things to ask for. And the reason this is important is because if you were in prison and one day you got free, and after you're free, you're like, man, I miss that prison food. That jail cell, that mush they used to give me, ugh. Mm. Can I go back to, can I, can I get that food? If you miss prison food, then it's the same as saying you miss what? 
you miss prison. Allah tested them, and Allah is showing them that the price of freedom is you had to let go of some of the things you became used to. You had to get out of your comfort zone. That was the price of freedom. So when they told Musa that we miss prison food, then they were actually not appreciating the taste, not of food, they couldn't appreciate the taste of freedom. They couldn't appreciate that. Allah says to them, eat from the good and pure things that we've provided you. The good and pure things is the same kind of bland food. But you know what makes it so good and so pure? That it's coming with freedom. That it's coming with dignity. They don't have to live like animals. They don't have to be treated like worthless, pathetic creatures that are owned by other human beings. They don't have to be treated with humiliation. Soldiers can't just walk into their home and kill their boys and let the women live. Young men can't just watch their mothers being mistreated on the street by Egyptian soldiers under the Pharaoh's rule and not be able to say anything, not be able to do anything. They don't have to live like that anymore. They are free. So Allah is telling them directly once they get free, eat from the good and pure things that we've provided you. And then he says, وَلَا تَطْغَوْ فِيهِ And this is where the unique part begins in Surah Taha. He says, and don't, listen to the translation, it's strange. Don't rebel in it. Don't be rebellious in it. What is it referring to? The food. How do you rebel in food? What does it mean? Allah is saying, eat from this food and don't rebel in this risk. Allah is saying that when I give you blessings, you get so drowned in those blessings, you get so comfortable in those blessings that you start taking those blessings for granted. And as a result of taking them for granted, you feel entitled. And when you feel entitled, you start disobeying Allah in all kinds of ways. There's an interesting formula Allah is talking about that He has talked about with other nations. So I'm going to take you to some other nations and then come back here. Allah describes, He criticizes disbelievers all over the Quran. But there's one particular kind of people that Allah especially goes after in the Quran. They're called Al Mutrafeen. The Mutrafeen are people who basically live large. If they want to have a meal, there's like a whole feast. If they want to go on a vacation, they're going to take an entire entourage with them. They don't want to go to the beach, they want to take their yacht to the beach. You understand? The people that live super large and splurge and spend and spend and spend. You know people that have fancy weddings or parties and they give every guest that comes, they give them a diamond something or a gold something and like, why did you do that? Or you give everybody a car. You're just spending and spending. These people are called mutrafeen. And Allah has a lot to say about those people that those kinds of people become the most reckless in terms of Allah. They don't remember Allah at all. They get so lost in their luxury and they become so entitled that they develop what you can call nowadays God complex. They become like that. Allah is telling the Israelites and they don't even have a lot right now. They only have manna and salwa. But He's saying it may be manna and salwa now, but watch out. You get used to Allah's blessings and you're not grateful, you're gonna become rebellious in no time. Because you'll enjoy the blessings of Allah, life is gonna be easy, and when life becomes easy, you're gonna become rebellious. You have your own room. Like the idea that a kid has their own room, maybe in the time of Fir'aun that used to be a thing. But this is not a thing. In the Muslim world or most of the world, the family has a room, not the kid has a room. You have your own room, you can change the temperature in your room. You know, you have your own TV. Oh my God, your life is so bad. You only have a PS4. You have every luxury possible and these kids are so miserable and so depressed and so angry and so bratty and so entitled and so loud and so rebellious. And I don't know, I don't think I believe in Islam, mom. It doesn't make much sense to me. I don't know why we pray and stuff. It's so backwards. You know where a lot of that's coming from? It's coming from being mutrafeen. Because when someone gets used to luxury, then the idea, I have to be grateful for what I have, it starts disappearing. It starts going away little by little by little. Now the Israelites are not millionaires yet. They basically just have manna and salwa, and instead of a house, they have a cloud, right? So they're living outdoors. So they're not living large, but Allah is warning them. Listen, be grateful and live within the halal, because if you become rebellious, taking the blessings I've given you for granted, He says, listen to these words, فَيَحِلَّ عَلَيْكُمْ غَضَبِي Then my rage will be unleashed on you. Allah didn't say, then you will be in trouble or you will be sinful. The wording is very strong. He said, my rage, will become unleashed. Yahilla. Halla halla al-uqda means to undo a knot. Allah's anger is being held back. And Allah says, I will let it go. I will let it go on you. If you're not grateful for what I've given you. And by the way, the biggest thing Allah has given them is two things. In the worldly sense, freedom. And in the spiritual sense, guidance. Two things. 
For my heart, it's guidance. For my body and my being in this life, it's freedom. Allah has given them both of those things. Don't take them for granted. And whoever my anger falls on, that person is as good as someone who has fallen off a cliff. Hawa. Hawa in Arabic, to fall from somewhere high, to fall somewhere low. It's like Allah is saying, these are the people that are truly going to be humiliated. Ash-Sha'rawi rahimahullah had beautiful commentary about this ayah. I read that today and I was so moved by it. He said, if you are used to the luxuries of this life and you forget about Allah, like you have good looks, you have health, you have money, you have car, you have pleasures, you have everything in this life. And you become rebellious to Allah. Hawa also means no matter how hard you try, you're gonna get old. No matter how hard you hold on, the car is gonna get old. The money is gonna get old. Even if you become wealthier, your body will not get stronger. Your body will become weaker. You will try to fight it. And you will try to do research on what surgery I can do or what medicine I can take to feel younger and look younger. But you're fallen. It's getting taken away from you no matter what you do there's one thing that's for sure coming if you live a life if I live a life of disobedience and that is Allah's anger being unleashed on me sooner or later quite literally I will fall he's as good as fallen this is the warning Allah gave directly to the Israelites 